Welcome to the Archetypal Mosaic. This is Mikhail Tank. Today on the show, a brilliant author about stones, healing, and Reiki, and wonderful, helpful healing subjects. On the phone is Nicholas Pearson. The book we're going to discuss today is The Seven Archetypal Stones. Welcome, Nicholas. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, for our audience, please know that this show is for entertainment and informa- informational purposes and enjoyment. Now, let's start with your book, The Seven Archetypal Stones. I hold this uh, dear to me because I tell you, I, even though I've worked with stones from my childhood and I have my own favorites, which I'll discuss later, um, your book is a wonderful reference manual uh, to keep at home, in the car, wherever you are, just to learn the history, the background, the archetypal value of these particular seven stones. How did you decide on these seven? Well, easily, I could have, I could have selected more than seven, um, but these are kind of the most universal of all the ones that I was working with. There were a few criteria that don't seem to be um, revered worldwide, uh, even if they're only found in limited regions and needed to be able to be traded and seen by cultures near there and everywhere. So um, these particular seven stones have these sort of universal applications throughout history um, in spite of cultural, religious, spiritual, linguistic divides. People tend to associate the same symbolism with all seven of these stones. Um, so uh, that was kind of the starting point. And when I finally sat down to narrow down the list to a uh, more concise number, it was almost as if these seven raised their hands and volunteered to be in the book. And does any one of the seven, is any one of the seven even closer to you? Do you have a favorite? I would probably say Obsidian. Um, partly for selfish reasons, it's helped me a lot. Uh, it's been a really valuable ally and healer in my own life, but also as far as the, the book is concerned, the whole book was born out of an idea that I had while driving to work with a piece of obsidian in my pocket. Mm. So, um, you know, it, it sort of opened the, the gateway through which all the inspiration came. And in its own right, it is a stone of initiation. So it sort of initiated me into the role of the scribe, so that way I could begin listening to the stories of these seven stones. and incorporating them into this book. Beautifully said. Um, if I can ask, what what um, category was your work in that you were driving to, and how did the obsidian, which comes from, is basically a volcano glass, right? How did that initiate uh-huh. everything for you? Um, I was in retail management at the time. I was working for Corporate America and had climbed the, the rungs of the ladder up to a, you know, a reasonable position. And uh, I, I tended to keep at least one stone in my pocket or around my neck on any given day, oftentimes more than one. But uh, that particular day when I was just sort of tuning in um, to, to see which stones are volunteering to come with me, Obsidian was the ally that said, hey, I'm ready for you. And um, I, I hadn't even gotten far from home when the realization that no matter where you go in the world, obsidian is used for the same two physical things uh, in the ancient world um, as reflective surfaces. We've got obsidian mirrors from Central and South America as well as from the Anatolian Peninsula, you know, thousands upon thousands of miles apart, separated by millennia of time. So clearly these were cultures that did not communicate with one another and share their obsidian-based optical technology. Um, and we also see it in the form of cutting edges, blades and knives, some that are clearly just for ceremonial use, they're too delicate to cut anything in the physical, as well as more utilitarian things like arrowheads and spear points. Um, even in today you can find um, uh, obsidian scalpels that are used for certain types of surgery because um, it's a more concise and more deft cutting edge that does less damage to um, surrounding tissues than stainless steel does because we can get it to a thinner, finer point. So, you know, there's this kind of realization that obsidian has these broad symbolic representations and those physical artifacts are directly uh, representative of its spiritual energies, its deeper teachings. That's what started that whole path of starting to thinking about stones archetypally. Tell me, what what makes obsidian, is it stronger than glass, and what makes it dark? So obsidian is glass. It's got the same hardness as glass. 
um, which is you know, less than that of crystal and quartz, for example. And um, you know, most obsidian appears to be black, but when cut in thin sections, it's usually uh, a greenish or brownish color, sometimes gray. Uh, so it's not a, a true black per se, but it's you know, microscopic inclusions of metals like iron and manganese and magnesium and aluminum and other things that give it its dark color. Um, different varieties of obsidian have different variations in color or very unique optical effects. The rainbow obsidian with these sort of iridescent bands that can be revealed when it's polished. And those come from various mineral contents that are suspended in its glass structure. Now, let's talk a little bit about the scrying aspect. Um, scrying mirrors have been used for a long time, and how do they um, how do they initiate the unconscious to uh, expel the future and other qu answers? So one of Obsidian's gifts is to sort of part the veil, if you will. Um, we see it as this tool that sort of cuts through the nature of things in, in its sharper aspects, like as a spear point or arrowhead or knife. Uh, it kind of helps hone the mind, focus it into that one-pointed uh, state of being. And we need that as sort of a prerequisite to scrying and to be able to hold that focus, which seems a great tool for engendering that amount of focus. But further, it's also something that helps us see beyond the surface of things. If we have a you know, brilliantly polished piece of obsidian, if we look into it, we see a great reflection there. Um, to ancient people who couldn't make their own glass or metal mirrors, obsidian was a really good tool that they had available to them for making a mirror. But what you see is not a full-color, realistic, lifelike representation of you. You see this sort of ghostly outline in these sort of dim, muted colors. And so it represents peering into the shadow self, peering into the unknown, the subconscious. And these are kind of the links that we have to non-ordinary consciousness, the sort of shamanic or spiritual reality that's you know, just beyond our own everyday material world. So when we use obsidian for scrying, we're getting both of these aspects. We're getting that ability to focus and cut through whatever background noise there might be in our mind. And then we're also getting the parting of the veil so we can see into the deeper nature of reality. Thank you. And now, a fun question. If, let's say, you're going to an event about your book or somewhere in the future, and a fan, somebody who admires you, wants to bring you the stone of your dreams, what would be the stone of your dreams that you don't have in your collection? You know, um, I think that's hard to say because there are something like 14,000 valid mineral species and many, 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 many rocks that are comprised of those. So, you know, I certainly couldn't have them all in my collection, but like snowflakes, no two are alike. Even something as everyday as quartz or agate or amethyst, these are things that, you know, we pick up two specimens of and they'll never be identical. So I kind of appreciate each one for being unique. Of course, there are weird and wonderful things I'd love to add to my collection, but, um, you know, I appreciate every stone there is. Beautiful. Um, the next stone we're going to talk about is jade, which is one of my seven favorites, except I divide mine into two stones, and you have it under one thing, which is both nephrite and jadeite. The history of jadeite has indeed been conflicted, and Burmese jadeite, as long as it's conflict-free, is really um, much more expensive, especially the imperial jade kind, which is the translucent kind of darker green. And then there's the nephrite. My favorite nephrite comes from New Zealand. Um, tell me about jade as a whole. You have it under one chapter. Um, how do the two stones behave differently? Um, how can people use them or enjoy them um, as two different elements? And what do you like about jade? Well, to start with, you know, jade is one of those things that was really challenging to write it not one distinct mineral. Um, technically, one of its two varieties is not even a mineral at all. It's a rock because it's an admixture of two different substances. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of variation. We add to that also the sort of uh, inability of ancient cultures to, to separate the two very clearly. Um, in, in Chinese, the word for jade is sometimes used just sort of analogous is our word for stone or precious stone. So lots of other things have jade in their title in Chinese that aren't, aren't chemically speaking jade. So it, it took a lot to sort of sift through 
defined just the ancient lore that is, was ascribed to these two stones. Um, before talking about what makes them different, let's talk about what makes them similar. Sure. Um, apart from a similar external appearance, if we look at their composition, um, they share a lot of elements in common. Both of them belong to the same crystal class, the same sort of geometrical class. They're monoclinic minerals um, that, are, that they're comprised from. And they are both often formed by um, metamorphic activity, uh, especially the things that cause mountains to form. So these sorts of chemicals and structures and processes give jade of either variety very similar energies. But it is the sort of nitty-gritty details that make them distinct. When we look at nephrite jade, which was the classical jade of China, for example, um, this particular stone is made out of these sort of crumpled and twisted fibers of minerals in the amphibole series, mostly um, trimolite and actinolite. Um, and then various amounts of other things in there will give jade a, a wide variation in color. So this, this sort of structural integrity that it's got makes it um, tougher than steel, although it is not harder than steel. The way that those crystal fibers are entwined together makes them very tenacious, uh, very difficult to break apart. So jade has this ability to withstand the erosive nature of time itself, especially the, the nephrite jade. Jadeite, on the other hand, uh, was actually the first jade to be named by Westerners. And it was only when the uh, Spaniards were visiting Central and South America and met the jade there that it was eventually adopted into Western languages as being jade. Um, so that was the first jade we named. Um, it was the more recent of the two discovered. In China, for example, it really has only been the imperial jade for a couple of centuries compared to nephrite. Um, jadeite structure is a little bit more granular. When we magnify the way the crystals are comprised, they're kind of stacked together like grains of sand cemented together would be. Um, that particular structure is part of what allows it to be a little bit more luminous looking. Um, it allows more light to penetrate through than those crumpled and twisted fibers of nephrite. Um, it is a little bit harder, although not quite as tough, as uh, nephrite. And because of that sort of granular, stacked, cemented together uh, morphology of the microscopic crystals in it, it tends to have a little bit more of a, an edifying effect on our material and spiritual bodies. So it's a little bit more grounding, strengthening, and centering. Whereas the nephrite, for example, really helps to promote movement and flow of things. Now, uh, when you said the Spaniards found uh, jadeite, uh, was that in Guatemala? Um, it wasn't only in Guatemala. There's, there's jade found in Mexico. There's jade found in many parts of Central and South America. I don't, I don't really know um, in which country they first found it, um, especially because, again, they, they didn't have the technology to separate true jade from jade lookalikes. So it would be hard to say exactly where it came from. Now, what's interesting is uh, the green that provides the imperial green to jadeite um, is the same exact uh, substance that gives green to emeralds. Right, and red to rubies. Uh, that is chromium. And how can chromium provide green for some and red for others? How does that work? Um, it tends to have to do with the, the shape of the bonds, if you will. Um, there are a lot of elements that, when present in gemstones, provide an array of colors. Iron is a great example. Um, iron is what makes amethyst purple and citrine yellow. It's what makes um, other things brilliant red. And um, something like aquamarine, for example, gets its blue-green color from iron as well. So in part, it's you know the, the physical matrix of the stone is going to have some relationship with optics, the way it bends light, for example, and then the state of oxidation, um, you know, which ionic state that that particular trace element is in, whether it's iron or chromium, is also going to influence it. And the way that that particularly ionized um, element fits into the crystal matrix, that crystal lattice, will also have a relationship with light. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in which state of oxidation is likely to give us which colors, but, um, you know, by and large, lots of things code for different colors in the mineral kingdom. Since we started talking about amethyst and citrine, which happens to be the same thing in different heating, um, 
Manganese also provides the color for amethyst, which happens to be my favorite of all. Um, let's talk about that. Now, is every citrine, was it originally an amethyst? Well, first I want to back up. Um, manganese has never really been found in any significant quantity in amethyst. In probably the turn of the 20th century, the belief was that it was probably manganese that caused the purple color, but subsequent analyses have proven that it's only iron, maybe iron and a handful of other mm. things, but predominantly the iron itself. So, um, but, no manganese uh, does that. Uh, now, the, as far as is all citrine originally amethyst, probably not in terms of what's happening in the earth. Um, again, it comes down to that state of oxidation. There are lots of factors that can cause a sort of golden yellow color. It's not just the iron content. It can also be uh, an aluminum content, which is what makes smoky quartz brown to gray to black. Um, so there, there are various factors that, that can cause a citrine to be a citrine. Um, you know, nowadays, on, in the gemstone market, it's very common to see you know 80% or more of colored gemstones receiving some form of treatment. So most citrine that you see that's been cut and faceted and polished um, has probably undergone some form of heating, even if only to improve its color. It may not originally have been amethyst, but um, it's still probably getting some sort of process applied to enhance its appearance. Now, in order for, but that's an interesting thing though, if you take amethyst and you heat it um, very strongly for a, for a certain period of time, you get, you, get, you get kind of a fake citrine, right? Yeah, you get a, a, a golden yellow quartz. And then the natural citrine that grows in Madagascar, Brazil, wherever it grows, um, does it have the exact same structure and compound as amethyst underneath the color? Not necessarily. Um, some do and some do not. Okay. Um, so back to amethyst. Now, what makes amethyst? Now, it also emits negative ions and has a, cleans the kind of electromagnetic field. Can you discuss that? Um, actually, that's never something I've really covered in my research. Mm -hmm. um, what does amethyst do? How does it help people? So amethyst is a stone of transmutation. It is sort of the emissary of the violet ray, which is the ray of alchemy, of transmutation, of magic, of the transformation of our consciousness. So the first thing that it does is it helps to highlight whatever the limitations to those acts of transfiguration might be. So the word amethyst itself comes to us via Greek, amethustos, meaning not drunken. So when we are working with it, it helps us find those things that might hold us back, that might um, intoxicate us. And that's not always a, a literal physical substance. It could be the thoughts that we tend to, you know, overthink, the behavioral patterns we tend to overdo, the emotions that we might feel too much that keep us from really experiencing authentic growth or true peace or, you know, abiding happiness. So after finding what these limiting influences are, Amethyst gives us the authority, the permission, the energy to sort of stay away from them, to say, you know what, I'm going to set a healthy boundary here and I'm not going to engage in this anymore. And once we do that, suddenly we have the ability to really transform our lives. It allows us to take something that might be a negative and limiting force and turn it into something positive, a growth experience, the potential to just totally transform. Now, amethyst by some people is considered to be a kind of a, a messed up quartz because it's impure. Now, when people t uh, explain it to be an impure quartz, it feels so wrong to me because to me it feels like the purest of the quartz. How do you feel about these kind of explanations? You, have you seen what I'm talking about? You know, it's not really something I've encountered, only because most of the colored gemstones with which we're familiar are, are things that have trace amounts of other things in them. Jade, for example, if it were perfect and pure in nature, would have no color whatsoever. The same is true of, um, you know, ruby, sapphire, which are forms of corundum. All forms of quartz in, in its most pure state would be totally colorless, and our, our mineral kingdom would be a lot more drab. <laughs> and the thing is that when it comes to the the world of nature. Nature is perfectly imperfect. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as perfect in nature. So I don't consider 
and this is to be impure. I just think of it as quartz with trace amounts of iron in it. That doesn't make it less pure or more pure or, or anything else. It's just a totally different personality as far as its energy goes. Beautifully said. Thank you. Um, let's go to Emerald, another one of my favorites. Um, so there's Green Barrel, which is uh, a much lighter emerald, and then there is Emerald. Um, at which point, at which delineation does Green Barrel become Emerald? It depends on who you ask. Um, you know, if you look at the Gemological Institute of the Americas, they're a little bit more forgiving as to what can cause the green color. Um, here in the U.S., the, the abiding organizations state that in addition to chromium, vanadium is also uh, a valid coloring agent for emerald. Whereas over in Europe, for example, their um, gemological associations do not recognize vanadium bearing barrel as being emerald. So it's really a matter of opinion. It's not really a, there's no hard line between one shade of green and the next. It's it's very subjective, and that's just the way color works in general, not just in the jewelry industry, but in life in general. You know, for me, for example, I am rather profoundly colorblind, so I tend to use color as the last identifying factor when I'm working with stones, because generally speaking, it is the least important thing that we work with, even energetically. Color only accounts for about one fourteenth or maybe 7% of a stone's total energy. That means about 93% of the energy we experience in a stone is actually defined by its composition, its morphology, its formation habit, that internal um, crystal structure, as well as the formation processes that are involved in bringing it to us. Wow, that's, and who, who came up with those percentages about the color? Um, my friend and mentor, Naisha Azian. I see. She's a co-author of the Book of Stones and the creator of the Crystal Ally Card. She's a brilliant crystal healer and a wonderful teacher. Yes, uh, I, I, I have those books with Robert Simmons. Uh, she co-collaborates, right? Yeah, they're wonderful books. Um, is, is his name Robert Simmons? Did I say that correctly? Yes. Okay. It's interesting. For me, it's different, though. For me, the color of the stone has a tremendous value. Because, for example, the darker amethysts... Um, and the uh, you know and the and the darker green jade and stuff as long as it's natural unheated untreated it has much more power when I put it on and the things that I can do with it than for example very light colored amethysts and stuff like that so I don't know I guess it depends on the person working for me it is a little bit different um, now well, you see, I, would, I would interject here that what you're feeling is actually the mineral content. The color is the visible representation okay. of some of that mineral content, mm -hmm. but the energy you're actually experiencing is not due to the color itself, but what it's made from. But you know, on, on the other hand, like if you heat a stone in order to make it darker, which a lot of people do, the content of the mineral doesn't change. It's the heating that changes, correct? Correct. So there are different ways yeah, of, so. of re changing the color without changing the mineral content. And, and, and what about that? What about heating... Uh, stones and treating them. Do you feel a difference in uh, in the magical value in that or not? For me, it's a tremendous difference. Like, if anything is heated and treated, I basically can't work with it. What about you? So here's the deal. There are some treatments that are very gentle and mimic those that are found in the earth. Heating, for example, is is a very slow and easy process on the gemstone. It doesn't cause any irreparable damage to its energy but it does give you a false economy. So let's say, for example, you're working with something like aquamarine. Mm -hmm. The majority of aquamarine you find on the market today has been heated. Heating will deepen and clarify the stone, but it will not change the structure of anything inside. So it will appear to be more saturated with the materials that cause its energy than it really is. So you'll find a heated stone will work more gently than a natural stone of equal color and clarity. Other treatments, for example, like irradiation, can actually cause irreparable damage to the matrix of the stone and render it non-therapeutic. I, I do not work with irradiated gemstones for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of other treatments that are kind of controversial, like all those aura quartzes and things. And uh, when I was younger, I used to find them really enchanting, and there were a lot fewer of them on the market. And these days, I think they're about pretty to look at, and that's really all the work that I do with them. But, um, you know, sometimes there are ways that the mineral kingdom and the human kingdom can collaborate to make man-made stones or, you know, treated or enhanced stones that are really magical, that are really profoundly um, healing tools 
do in you, the right hands and for the right person. Do you have a uh, one in particular that you'd like to discuss that you're talking about? The uh, partially human enhanced. Yeah. So you know, for example, mm -hmm. I have some really beautiful lab created quartzes that are actually grown here in the U.S. Uh, friends of mine get these from the gentleman who grows them himself and grows them mostly for the pure joy of it. He's not doing it because it is where his primary earnings are or because he's trying to turn them out for the jewelry industry. Um, you know, he's a, a scientist and a crystallographer. He enjoys the challenge of trying to get these quartzes to grow in unique shapes, really unusual morphologies that you don't find often in lab-created quartzes that are very hard to replicate in nature. And because of the amount of love and respect that he has for the crystal, it, it's apparent that these stones, which are so much younger than their natural counterparts, are are the creations of this sort of loving energy. And I do work with them occasionally. It's not something that forms a part of my everyday practice, um, but they're, they're beautiful teachers in their own right. Now tell me, um, in terms of the market value of stones throughout generations, centuries, for example, you know, again, like, uh, Siberian amethyst versus Brazilian amethyst, meaning natural darker, or the imperial jade versus the the light color jade. All the darker ones in those cases are worth so much more on the market, like in terms of monetary. Why do you think that is? Well, honestly, those are tastes that have changed from century to century. Although there are a handful of things that are, um, you know, long-standing rules. If you go back far enough in China, it was actually the pure white jades, or sort of the greasy, yellowy, dingy jades um, that were the most popular. So um, gemstones go in and out of fashion, just like clothes do. Um, and there are a few things that are perennial favorites, but even they have fluctuations in their market value. We see it in precious metals as well, where you know supply and demand changes because of changing tastes on the market. Mm -hmm. And that particular white jade you're talking about is called, is it called Mufat? I'm sorry, what was that? The white jade you're talking about that was that is still highly precious, but for bangles mostly. It's called is it called Mufat Jade? That's one of them, yeah. yeah. I mean there are there are a whole lot of um you know, different jades that have different values and different purposes throughout history. And it's not something I have a an intimate knowledge of, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I did a lot of cursory research on it several years ago when I was writing the manuscript. And the Mufat is actually nephrite, interestingly enough. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, and you know, honestly, the precious jade of China has been nephrite for the majority of mm -hmm. China's history of working with jade. Now, uh, you have several more stones here, which are lapis, quartz, and diamond. Um, which, how would you uh, describe those stones? Because they're part of the seven here. So, lapis is this wonderful metamorphic rock. Rather than being a single mineral, it's actually comprised of several minerals together. The three chief constituents are the ultramarine blue lazurite, the golden flecks of iron pyrite, and the white swirls of calcite. And then it'll have various amounts of things like diopside and, and other minerals that we won't try to pronounce on air. Um, and this is a really mystical stone. It's found in some of the highest and youngest mountain ranges in the world. And, um, you know, because it formed so close to the heavens, and resembles a starry sky. It has this long-standing tradition of celestial representation, the connection to the goddess Nuit, who is the goddess of the night sky in ancient Egypt, connections to the queen of heaven, the sort of great goddess of many of the um, ancient goddess-worshipping traditions like Astarte and um, Inanna. This is a stone that really helps to wake us up to the fact that we too are celestial beings. We're from the same origins as the stars in the sky. We all come from that same great force that guides the universe and glues it together. Um, Lapis is a really wonderful stone for awakening insight. It's often associated with eye imagery. So we see it in the form of the eye of Horus and the cosmetics are made for eyes in ancient Egypt. We also see it adorning statues and other parts of um, the Near East, uh, it's just a, a wonderful ability to open our, our insights, to activate the third eye, as we might say in the you know, New Age lingo, but to go much deeper and show us that our real sight doesn't come from our mind, it comes from our heart. The chief function of lapis is to harmonize our heart and our mind and allow them to work in total unison. You know, it's interesting, I learned recently from a Kabbalah rabbi of mine that 
Um, in the Old Testament, sapphire is considered to be one of the most magical stones, but in reality, the sapphire in the Old Testament is actually lapis. Yes, the word sapphire, um, as we know it, is originally de derived from the Hebrew term um, sapir, which mm -hmm. means to, to scratch, to inscribe, to mark, and actual sapphire would have been far too tough, far too hard, mm -hmm. and wouldn't be carvable. On top of that, it wouldn't come in large enough deposits that you could carve anything of significance onto it, like the tablets of the law, for example. Mm -hmm. So all of the sapir that you see in um, the Bible is actually not the fuzzily. Now, um, a little bit about uh, quartz and diamond, and then, um, and then a few more questions. Sure. So quartz is really chiefly about light. Um, you know, I very well could have ended the book with quartz because it, it sort of engenders so many of the other teachings of these stones and begins to internalize them and incorporate them into our own being. We see crystal lenses and crystal spheres and globes and burning orbs throughout the ages, and many of these are entombed with people because they're meant to be funerary offerings or, or votive offerings that were meant to help the soul return to the celestial spheres, um, much in the same way that light passing through one of the crystal lenses would be condensed and focused to a single point. They believe that our soul journeyed from the sort of immaterial plane of light into the physical body by passing through a, a metaphorical crystal sphere. So we could use them for the reverse journey too on the way out. Um, in the most sort of prototypic sense, that a natural quartz crystal is a natural wand. It is a shamanic tool for influencing reality. But this natural shape of the crystal is a hexagonal prism, and that too is optical uh, imagery. When light passes through it, it's refracted into its seven incident rays, um, and it can really be a powerful tool for letting us see and experience the fullness and richness of life because of that same ability to refract all experiences into their components. So quartz is all about light, and ultimately what we find is that it's about taking that light and you know, drawing it deep into us at the core so that we see that we are really made of light and not gross matter. Um, now, a quick question about that. Kind of, sure. Um, Go ahead. When, when one reads the chapter about quartz and what you're discussing now, does that apply to all quartz, including smoky, amethyst, everything else? Or is, are you only talking about clear quartz? To a degree, I'm talking about all members of the quartz family, but, um, you know, the, the, I'd say the chief factor is that it has to be transparent um, if it's a colored quartz. You know, if we have something like, well, amethyst gets its own chapter, but, you know, a, a deep dark amethyst or a real deep black smoky quartz like the Morian quartz and Karen Grumman's out there, those, those would kind of not really work for the optical imagery because they don't let light pass through them. So um, I use kind of a, Clear quartz is the measuring stick for everything in that chapter, but certainly if you have a transparent piece of any other variety of quartz, you could use it for all of the exercises to more or less the same end. Now, what about Herkimer diamonds, which is uh, a crystal clear quartz from Herkimer, New York? Would you consider that, like some do, to be the, uh, the highest frequency or not really? Um... I would say it's got a different personality, but the words high frequency are a little bit deceptive. Uh, you know, the truth is that high frequency is not necessarily better, and most of the things that we perceive as being high frequency are actually lower frequencies. Hmm. Consciousness, for example, as it ascends, lowers its frequency. Frequency is the number of times that a sine wave repeats on that little graph of, you know, in, in a wave of energy. Hmm. So the higher our consciousness is, the more elevated it is. Um, the lower the frequency is. Mm -hmm. So if we really want to ascend, we're, we're lowering our frequency. What we're doing, though, is we're increasing our amplitude, which is the volume of the signal. Frequency itself represents the station that we're tuned into. If our consciousness is like radio, amplitude would be the volume. So um, all crystals, in theory, ought to help us in improve the amplitude of the energy. And, you know, if they're also trying to help us kind of work on that integration of higher consciousness, they're also going to set us on the right station at the same time. Wonderful. And now a little bit about diamond. Yeah, so diamond takes a lot of the same imagery of quartz as it relates to light and takes it to a whole new octave. It's really something that 
is very brilliant, very radiant, immensely bright, and was unconquerable. The word diamond itself actually comes from Greek adamas, meaning not conquered or not tamed. You see the same root damas in words like dominion and tame. Um, and so diamond was the stone that conquered all other stones, yet could not be conquered by them. And that's because of its um, hardness. It is a 10 on that scale of, of hardness. Um, and so it's sort of the, the crowning glory of the mineral kingdom. It is the king of all gemstones. One of its other um, epithets in many cultures is either the thunderstone or, or lightning stone. It sort of represents the flash of enlightenment. And there's there's no dimmer switch on enlightenment. We can't we can't be a little bit enlightened. We're either there or we're not. So it comes to us like a flash of lightning. And the word for diamond in, in especially several Asian languages is the exact same word for thunderbolt or lightning. These are words like Dorje and Bajra and Congo and um, a handful of other things that are um, analogous to them. Now, which of these stones would you say people should be careful with unless they have a very clear intent and kind of a purity of soul? Well, diamond especially really requires a, a reasonable amount of caution. There are a lot of diamonds that are not as therapeutic in quality as others that are out there on the market. Um, in diamond therapy... You know, has its own set of protocols um, that I have not personally studied. So that is that is one that really requires a lot of sensitivity on behalf of the uh, practitioner. But you know, all stones really are meant to be these sort of mirrors to our consciousness. And you know, if if we're putting out the right intention and coming from the right space, they're going to enhance that. And if we're not coming from the right space, they're going to reflect that back to us to show us maybe what isn't working. So you know, something like obsidian can be a really fierce teacher of that lesson and really illuminate our shadow self, which is not always a pleasant experience. So um, you know, kind of have to do the homework and be prepared for that with any of our stones. The, the more deeply we want to go with the healing value of crystals, the more we have to do the work on ourselves first. Um, now, there's a few stones that I love and po possibly would add to a different project, which are turquoise, z-agates, and alexandrites. Those would be the ones I would add. Um, are there any that you would add to this book, if you could? Yeah, there, there are several that didn't quite make the cut. Uh, turquoise was one of them. Um, agate in general was something that I considered, um, and also either ruby or carnelian, something with that sort of real rich, red, fiery energy. Um, you know, the, the honest truth is there wasn't enough of a cohesive scene embodied by the majority of those, with the exception of turquoise, and so much of it overlapped with other stones that it would have been very redundant in the book. Got it. Now, your future book, um, or your coming out book, is the, the one about the heart. Can you describe that to us? For sure. I'm, I'm really excited about this project. Uh, it's called Crystal Healing to the Heart, Gemstone Therapy for Physical, Emotional, and Spiritual Well-Being. And it sort of tours a, a system, an approach to reaching wholeheartedness. Um, and it is the approach I've taken in my own life. So I didn't really draw upon anyone else's healing system. Um, I definitely dove hard into the research on the gemstones that are included in there, but... Um, as far as the, the way it's sort of organized and structured, that's that's my trial and error approach to, you know, showing up as a real person in life, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, and the stones themselves are a handful of really new and exciting things that um, you know, I've only recently gotten to work with in the last couple of years. And then there are lots of old standards that we would all associate with healing the heart, things like um, tourmaline and rose quartz. Um, but, you know, our, our heart chakra is not limited to just pink and green stones, so you're going to find things of every color of the rainbow in there. And it actually starts with some of the deep dark stones again, like obsidian and in the seven archetypal stones. We need stones like onyx and obsidian and um, even black tourmaline and hematite right there in one of the early chapters, because these are the things that sort of fortify us and expose to us where, where we need to bring the most healing. And then from there, every chapter is kind of like the stones are passing the baton onto the next theme of healing. So, you know, it covers things like forgiveness and healing the inner child, as well as learning to express from your heart and really live in a heart-centered reality. 
um, how to realign your will, your, your small self with that of the universe, and ultimately leads us up to that sort of alchemical nature of the heart as the, the crucible in which our own spiritual alchemy takes place through the transformative, through the transformative power of love. And what is the release for that? Um, that one is expected out on shelves on September 19th. Wonderful. Um, and then you're also working on a Reiki project book, right? Yes, I am. Um, it's in the editing process as we speak. Um, and that one's due out in um, early April. So that one's currently titled um, Foundations of Reiki Ryoho. Um, and it's a manual for Shoden and Okuden, or the, the first two degrees of Reiki. Wonderful. Nicholas, it's been a true pleasure having you on the Archetypal Mosaic. Thank you for the the definition of frequency versus amplitude. It was very nice to hear that. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I'm just really grateful to be on. Thank you so much for all your thoughtful questions. Thank you. Uh, everybody, check out the seven archetypal stones available on Amazon, at your local bookstores, in the magic shops, and wherever books are sold. Nicholas Pearson, thank you for being on the Archetypal Mosaic.